Hello everyone. Today let's talk about qualitative methods, applications for business and management research. This is the third of a series of webinars offered by the Philippine Academy of Management in 2020. I am Raymond Habaradas, a full professor at De La Salle University, where I also earned my Doctor of Business Administration degree. I am one of the governors of the Philippine Academy of Management and managing editor of the Philippine Academy of Management e-journal. But perhaps my most important qualification for giving this talk is that I love qualitative research. Since I completed my doctorate, I've done mostly qualitative research, many of which I have converted into journal articles, some of which have been published in Scopus indexed journals. I do mostly research along the lines of managing social enterprises, social business incubation, and business model innovation. I have also written more than a dozen teaching cases, the data for which were taken from qualitative research that I have undertaken with some of my colleagues over the past few years. As a result of the research I have done along these lines, I have been requested by several Asian organizations to write policy papers and policy briefs for them. So as you can see, qualitative research has been very useful to me in three ways. First, it feeds into my teaching. Second, it has allowed me to publish in reputable journals, which is very important if we want to get promoted in a university. And third, it allows me to contribute to policy making. Let me warn you though, that qualitative research is not easy. It is a very challenging undertaking, which is probably the reason why I want to do it. So perhaps it is most suitable for academic masochists like me. But there are benefits to doing qualitative research. For example, in our field work, we are able to hear a lot of interesting stories from people that we have interviewed. And we are given an opportunity to derive insights from these stories and to share these to other people so that they can generate lessons from the experiences of others. But doing qualitative research requires a certain set of skills we, which we must develop so that our outputs will be trustworthy and so that these will be useful and relevant to a greater number of people. So if you're interested to become a qualitative researcher like me, but you haven't tried it out before, these are the five things that you need to know about qualitative research. These are the characteristics of qualitative research according to Marshall and Rossman. One, it takes place in the natural world. Two, it draws on multiple methods that respect the humanity of participants in the study. Three, it focuses on both the phenomenon and its context. Four, it is emergent and evolving rather than tightly prefigured. Five, it is fundamentally interpretive. As we discuss each of these items in greater detail, allow me to share with you how these different characteristics have manifested themselves in some of the research projects that I have undertaken over the years. Number one, qualitative research takes place in the natural world. This simply means that in most cases, good qualitative research must be undertaken beyond the confines and comforts of our own homes. We should go out there, talk to people, ask them about their thoughts, their feelings, 
and their experiences. Let me share with you my experience when I did my field work for my dissertation. This was about the corporate social initiatives of the corporate foundations of Filipina Shell and Ayala Corporation. My dissertation involved gathering data about four major programs of Filipina Shell Foundation and two major programs of Ayala Foundation. This meant that I had to talk to people who were involved in implementing these programs and the beneficiaries of the said programs. My field work brought me to different places in Luzon. Closest to Lasal was a barangay in Pandacan, Manila, which implemented a successful solid waste management program. In Makati, I interviewed the leaders and program managers of Ayala Foundation and Shell Foundation. In Pasay and Taguig, I visited several Shell dealers involved in the Gasmo Bukasco program. In Laguna, I interviewed the division coordinator of DEPED Laguna and several beneficiaries of the Gilas program. In Rizal, I visited Shell's Saka training farm. In Bulacan and Nueva Ecija, I got to talk to several administrators of TESDA, which was an institutional partner of the Shell Foundation. Finally, I had to fly all the way to Palawan to visit Shell's Saka village and to talk to health workers involved in Shell's Kilusan Ligtas Malaria. So you can just imagine all the time and effort involved in doing my fieldwork. All in all, I talked to a total of 34 people, which translated to roughly 70 hours of interviews. So what are the implications of doing fieldwork for qualitative research? First, one must gain access to information. This means securing the approval of the organization's decision makers. This will facilitate the cooperation of other organization members. In my case, it helped that the executive director of the Shell Foundation was a former colleague of my dad. Goodwill helped me gain access to the company. When doing field work in communities, one must also coordinate with local government officials so that the community members will know that outsiders will visit them to ask questions. Bringing along a contact who can speak the local language might also help. Second, one must plan for logistical requirements. This means booking flights, choosing a hotel, and renting a venue for focus group discussions. When traveling to far-flung places, one must also arrange for local transportation. When I did my dissertation, I had to do all of these myself, but now I have a research assistant who takes care of all of these for me. Third, you need to set aside money for your plane fare, transportation and communication, and other research expenses, including tokens for interviewees or FGD participants. That is, if you are funding the research project yourself. If your research project is funded by your university or by an external funding agency, then good for you. Fourth, you need to take time off from work to be able to do field work. You must take into consideration the time needed for flights, local travel, as well as the availability of respondents. You must also set aside an extra day or two to allow for unexpected events, such as flight cancellations. If you are going to a beautiful place like El Nido in Palawan, then it would not hurt to include in your plan an extra day in the beach. Take advantage of such opportunities, which you can consider as one of the benefits of doing fieldwork. Number two. Qualitative research draws on multiple methods. Generating stories or narratives, which are the raw data of qualitative research, can be done in several ways. Also, interpreting these narratives will depend on the theoretical lens that you use. 
In some cases, you might need to use multiple frameworks to help you gather and interpret data in a systematic and rigorous manner. When we talk about research methods, we refer to data collection, analysis, and interpretation. Remember though that how we handle and process our data will affect the quality of our analysis and interpretation and must be part of what we must articulate in our research proposals. These are the activities involved in gathering and managing data. Aside from doing interviews and FGDs, one can also review documents and collect secondary data. In most of my qualitative research projects, I would begin by collecting secondary data and thoroughly reviewing these before I proceed with my interviews. Getting basic or background information about the organization that I seek to examine allows me to focus my questions on substantive matters and to engage my interviewee intelligently. For example, if you want to interview someone like Gawad Kalingas Tony Meloto, you would not want to be asking him questions, the answers to which can already be found in the book that he wrote or in the hundreds of feature articles written about him. That will be a waste of his time. It must be about something that he has not previously articulated or that has not yet been written about. When I finally do primary data gathering, I make sure that I have an audio recording of my interviews or FGDs. That is if my respondents consent to the interview or the FGD being recorded. But even if I have an audio recorder, I also take notes, which is useful when doing follow-up questions. I ask my research assistant to transcribe all of the interviews using an agreed-upon format. If the interview is done in English, one can use a software to do the transcription. Also, I keep a database of these audio files, transcripts, and other documents for easy retrieval. Analyzing and interpreting data involve the activities listed on the right column of this slide. Before analyzing your data though, I suggest that you immerse yourself in the data by reading and rereading the transcripts and documents a few times. Marshall and Rossman put it nicely when they said that researchers should think of data as something to cuddle up with, embrace, and get to know better. So if you don't have a special someone or a pet to cuddle up with, then you will know what to do. But joking aside, being intimate with our data will give us a feel of what the data offer. It will help in the subsequent activities of identifying patterns and themes as we go about analyzing our documents and transcripts. The next step is to select an appropriate theoretical lens to make sense of our data. It is also useful to interpret the data using an alternative theory to find out which one seems to offer a better explanation for the phenomenon that we are examining. Seeking alternative understandings might also involve consulting some of our respondents or engaging them in a dialogue to find out whether or not they share our interpretation. This is appropriate when our respondents are businessmen, managers, and entrepreneurs who might see things differently given their non-academic and practice-oriented backgrounds. Allow me to share with you my experience in doing this research about Bote Central, a social enterprise that has been helping Philippine coffee farmers through its innovative business model. For this project, my co-researcher Ian Mia and I 
described the Kapet Buhay program of Bote Central, which sought to revolutionize the Philippine coffee landscape. Done with the help of the Philippine Coffee Alliance, this program involved various stakeholders concerned with raising the productivity and improving the welfare of coffee farmers, especially those based in the uplands. For this project, we did data triangulation, which is defined as the act of bringing more than one source of data to bear on a single point. Data from different sources allow researchers to corroborate, elaborate, or illustrate the research question. For this project, we conducted interviews with Vai Reyes and Aliana Reyes of Bote Central and Dennis Rosales of Forest Foundation Philippines. We also collected secondary data, such as the Philippine Coffee Industry Roadmap, which gave us an extensive background of the challenges faced by the coffee industry in the Philippines and the plans that were formulated by industry players to address these challenges. Before we interviewed the Reyeses, we already collected online articles about Bote Central, which gave us an idea of its business model as well as of its product line. YouTube videos about Bote Central also provided data that we were able to use in our paper. One of the goals of data triangulation is to see whether the data we collect from various sources actually result into a convergence of evidence. If this is the case, then there is reason to be confident about the quality of the data we have collected, especially if we are collecting objective facts. But if one source provides data that is different from another source, then that is not necessarily a bad thing. It could be a matter of different attitudes and perspectives about a particular phenomenon, in which case divergence must be reflected in one's report or paper. For example, if we interview a business owner about his company's human resource management practices, it is likely that he might give a glowing account. However, if we interview several employees about the same thing, they might have a different opinion altogether. A thoughtful qualitative researcher must not be content with simply recording their responses. It might help to probe during the interview to understand the basis for the respondent's attitudes. It could be that the business owner thinks that his company's human resource management is effective because he offers compensation that is above the minimum wage and that there are no formal complaints among his employees. On the other hand, employees might think that they are not given enough training opportunities even if they are well compensated and that their work is repetitive and does not provide enough intellectual challenge. So what seems like a contradictory response is actually a result of different viewpoints about what effective human resource management is. After collecting data, the qualitative researcher must have a system of organizing the data for easy retrieval. This is essential, especially when one is dealing with voluminous data. In this slide, you see the Google Drive of our Bote Central research project. You can see that we created several folders under the main folder titled Bote Central Inclusive Supply Chains. Among these folders is a subfolder for our interview transcripts, a subfolder containing secondary data about the Philippine coffee industry, and a subfolder that contains related literature. We also included subfolders for photos, article drafts, and PowerPoint decks. Note that each of the subfolder has Bote Central in the file name, so that a search in Google Drive will automatically reveal these folders. I cannot overemphasize the importance of having a well-organized database 
especially if one is doing a multiple case study which can easily involve hundreds of documents. For our Bote Central research, we utilized three frameworks that guided our data collection, analysis, and interpretation. We utilized value chain mapping to illustrate the roles played by different players in the country's coffee supply chain. However, instead of adopting the premises of Porter's traditional value chain analysis, which emphasizes productivity, efficiency, and competitive advantage, we adopted the premises of value chain development, which used value chain analysis as a way to achieve inclusion of marginalized sectors. On top of these, we decided to complement these tools with systems thinking, given our observation that the Philippine coffee industry roadmap seems to have utilized value chain analysis in a simplistic manner, one that did not quite capture the dynamics of the interactions among the key players in the coffee industry. So after going through our data, Ian and I met several times and came up with a systems map on why coffee farmers in the Philippines are poor. Unlike traditional value chain analysis, which focused on the productivity of farmers and how this can be raised to improve the country's export competitiveness, we placed the coffee farmers front and center in our analysis. This was partly influenced by Bote Central's business model as a social enterprise. Only later did we encounter in a subsequent literature review the notion of value chain development which we incorporated in our analysis. After examining our initial systems map, we saw how Bote Central's various interventions actually corresponded to several leverage points in the systems map. This led to a major insight that Bote Central actually performed a coordinating function among the different stakeholders that sought to help the coffee farmers thus creating an ecosystem of support that contributed to a more inclusive coffee value chain. The point I am trying to make is that a qualitative researcher must be adept with various data gathering techniques. Also, he must be guided by appropriate conceptual and methodological frameworks. In our case, we had to learn more about systems thinking and systems dynamics before we were able to adapt these frameworks to suit our research purposes. Moreover, the qualitative researcher must be adept with a variety of analytical techniques. When doing qualitative case studies, these will include content analysis, pattern matching, and explanation building, among others. We must also remember that qualitative research must take into account ethical issues concerning human participants. A good rule of thumb is the principle of no harm. In the case of business and management research, this is relevant in several situations. For example, if we ask an employee about the leadership style of his manager, this might place him in a tight situation or might generate untruthful responses if confidentiality of responses is not assured. For the qualitative researcher, this means being able to design questionnaires properly and knowing how to conduct interviews skillfully. Number three, qualitative research focuses on context. Qualitative researchers recognize that the phenomenon they seek to understand does not take place in a vacuum. For example, the behavior of a manager is influenced by the organizational culture that surrounds him. Moreover, the boundaries between the phenomenon and the context within which it takes place are not often clear-cut and must be assessed in a holistic manner. Let me go back to my dissertation, which resulted in an article titled Shifting Philanthropic Motives, 
Shell's Corporate Social Initiatives in the Philippines. In this article, I argue that the company's primary motive for undertaking philanthropy can shift over time, and this results into a corresponding change in its philanthropic approach. In this paper, I demonstrated that Shell's philanthropic activities started with altruistic motives that were driven by corporate values and the conviction of its leaders. Later, these philanthropic activities were designed to legitimize the company's presence in communities in which it operates. Today, its major social initiatives are geared towards enhancing stakeholder relations and reflect its commitment to sustainable business practices. I was able to derive such a conclusion for the article because I did not only get data about Shell's corporate social initiatives, which was the phenomenon I was trying to explain. I also collected data about the company and its business environment, including socio-political developments that had an impact on the petroleum industry in the Philippines. To support my argument, I had to write a coherent and logical story based on qualitative data to show how these different variables affect each other. It helped that there was much that had been written about the company, and also that the Shell Foundation had documents, publications, and online material about its various programs since it was founded. Given the amount of qualitative data that I collected, I needed a system of organizing the data. So what I did was to prepare table shells that I could fill up with information concerning the social initiatives of the two foundations, as well as corporate developments, industry developments, and issues faced by the two companies. I must admit though, that midway through my dissertation, I stopped filling up the tables. Given that I was intimate with my data, the story was already clear in my mind. It's like the table shells had already been filled somewhere in my brain and could be easily retrieved once I began writing. For those who are interested to know more about the interaction between phenomenon and context, you can read Robert Yin's case study research, Design and Methods. The book provides a detailed discussion, differentiating single case design from multiple case design, including those with embedded units of analysis. Perhaps I can discuss more about case study research in a future webinar. So what are the implications for the qualitative researcher? He must be able to determine whether a research problem requires an holistic examination of a phenomenon that cannot be easily divorced from its context. In undertaking the research, he must be guided by a theoretical lens that could help provide a viable explanation for the proposed relationship between the variable of interest and contextual variables. Finally, he must be an engaging storyteller in short, he must be both analytical and creative. Number four, qualitative research is emergent and evolving. This means that the qualitative researcher must be ready for surprises. He must be flexible and willing to adjust his research design if warranted. Like a traveler who gets lost, he might just find himself in an interesting place that offers unexpected pleasures. Speaking of travel, I would like to share with you my experience in undertaking this research on sustainable tourism, which I recently did with my doctoral mentee, Jonah Bakilias. We were invited by the Asian Institute of Management to write a book chapter that highlighted sustainable tourism practices of selected organizations in Southeast Asia. For this study, we decided to write about Kinabalu National Park in Malaysia, Indochina Junk in Vietnam, 
and the Circle Hostel in the Philippines. Since it is expensive to travel to Malaysia and Vietnam, we had to settle with reviewing scholarly articles and other secondary sources about Kinabalu National Park and Indochina junk. Although the administrators of these two organizations agreed to answer our questions through email. For the Circle Hostel, we scheduled a weekend to interview the Echo Hostel's manager and staff in San Felipe Zambales, in addition to the interviews we conducted with the owners somewhere in Quezon City. For our paper, we adopted Spindler's weighted model of sustainable tourism as our framework. Our original goal was to simply describe how selected organizations within the tourism value chain implement their sustainability initiatives and how they provide social, environmental, and economic value to their respective communities. We also wanted to know how these organizations affect the behavior of other players within the tourism value chain and how they manage to sustain the positive environmental impact of their initiatives. When we went to Zambales, we just wanted to talk to the manager and staff of the Circle Hostel and to observe up close how the Echo Hostel operated. But since we completed our planned interviews in a day, we thought that it might be a good idea to talk to business owners of nearby establishments. We also decided to talk to the owners of the cafe where we had coffee after dinner. When we visited the mother of my mentee's friend who lived in the area, we also learned a great deal from her about how Sitio Liuliwa grew into a popular tourist area and the environmental challenges that have emerged as a result. The insights that we got from these unplanned conversations and pop-up interviews contributed to a better understanding of the dynamics of tourism in the area. The information that we gathered from our unplanned interviews and conversations led to some serendipitous findings. I saw how the governance of tourism value chains might have a strong influence on the environmental practices of individual firms. This occurred to me given my prior knowledge about the governance of global value chains, which I used in a research project that I did about the Philippine garments industry more than a decade ago. Coupled with the additional literature that I read about Kinabalu National Park and Indochina junk, I began to tinker with some ideas in my notebook, which eventually led to a typology of governance models for greening the tourism value chain. So what started as an attempt to simply describe the environmentally sustainable practices of selected tourism organizations ended up with an article that proposes a typology that our qualitative data revealed. This is our humble contribution to new knowledge. It is my opinion though that these serendipitous findings only come to those who are able to recognize them. Qualitative researchers must therefore be both systematic and flexible when gathering data. It will help for them to have a tentative framework to guide their study, but they must also look out for data that might not fit into this framework. Qualitative researchers will also benefit from having a wide knowledge base, especially of alternative theories. Finally, they must keep an open mind. Number five, qualitative research is fundamentally interpretive. This means having to deal with narratives and the meanings that people attach to them. Now, this is something that most business and management researchers in the Philippines might find difficult to accept, given that we have been made to believe that there is an objective reality. If one wants to embark on qualitative research though, then one must not be held hostage by the notion of objectivity. 
Let me explain this by recounting my experience as part of an interdisciplinary research team that conducted a research project that was commissioned by the Unilab Foundation. It is about the experiences of several companies who have employed the services of persons with intellectual disabilities or PWIDs. Our research team was composed of two psychologists, one sociologist, one historian, and a management scholar. Assuming that we tried our best to adopt an objective stance, our understanding of the phenomenon is necessarily limited by the frameworks that we used and colored by the expertise and viewpoints that we brought into our individual studies. For example, the psychologist was tasked to examine how exposure to work has contributed to the mental development of the PWIDs. The sociologist, on the other hand, examined how often the PWIDs interact with their mentally typical co-workers. The historian was tasked to look at how legislation and regulation on the inclusion of differently abled persons have progressed over the years. As the management scholar, I was asked to assess the human resource management practices of the companies in relation to the PWIDs. In short, we were initially like the six blind man and the elephant, since each of us had a specialized understanding of the phenomenon of differently abled persons in the workplace. For example, our psychologist found some evidence that work contributed to the mental development of the PWIDs, especially among the high functioning ones. My own study on HR practices of the firms show how the organizations had to make certain adjustments in terms of their hiring, selection, work conditions, and compensation policies to accommodate the PWIDs. But since we were engaged in an interdisciplinary research, we eventually had to consolidate our findings so as to come up with a comprehensive report for our client. As a result, we began to gain a more holistic appreciation of the phenomenon and came up with a socially constructed view of this particular reality. We finally had an idea of what the elephant actually looked like. One of the outputs of our team is this framework that draws from the insights of the individual studies. The framework illustrates what is needed to break the barriers and to expand the space for persons with disability in the workplace. This is an example of how multiple meanings through dialogue can result into a fresh and expansive interpretation of our social world. At this point, let me just promote a bit our MBA program in DLSU, which has pioneered the teaching of action research among business schools in the country. This type of research recognizes the interpretive nature of research. In a nutshell, we teach our MBA students to undertake first-person inquiry, second-person inquiry, and third-person inquiry. This trains them to be reflective and to examine their values, assumptions, and beliefs. It also trains them to respect the opinion of others and to understand where others are coming from by engaging them in dialogue and by collaborating with them as they try to address issues that they collectively face. So what does this mean for the qualitative researcher? First, he must be reflexive. He must be aware of his values, assumptions, and beliefs. Second, he must be willing to explore alternative frameworks and models. Third, he must be willing to collaborate with others. Fourth, he must be able to convince the potential users of his research by involving them in the process. Let me end by sharing this meme 
featuring Senator Cynthia Villar and Bea Alonzo. Bakit lahat ng inyong budget? Puro research. Baliw na baliw kayo sa research. Pero bakit parang galit ka? Pero bakit kasalanan ko? Parang kasalanan ko. It is likely that many people share the stance of the good senator, given that research is perceived as not having practical value. This is partly because many academics in the country have been focusing on research aimed at publishing, rather than at addressing actual problems that we face in our daily lives. It is my hope that we will find a way to combine both rigor and relevance in our conduct of research in the country, especially of qualitative research. This webinar obviously just offers a taste of what qualitative research is all about. But if you want to do research that allows you to talk to people and hear interesting stories, if you want to do research that compels you to develop your skills in different data gathering and analytical techniques, if you want to do research that offers some surprises here and there, if you want to do research that offers an intellectual challenge and that allows you to express your inner voice more fully, then welcome to my world. Welcome to the world of qualitative research.